Now, you're very welcome back. So we are turning to an interview on this week's Koi Gig podcast. Emma McCandy is the Reading captain. She is the Scottish captain. She's a high profile player. And speaking to the podcast and the interview has made waves both sides of the Irish. See, the FA have responded to it as well. She was highlighting the lack of support for pregnant players and her experience, as you'll hear back in 2021, was a pretty miserable one. Um, I think it was a season that we came back after COVID. Um, so I think I played up until I was like eight weeks. I remember playing, we played, uh, I never really got morning sickness, but I used to feel really, really sick, like later on in the afternoon. And we played Bristol away in like a night game. And it was like, I had the pre-match and I was like, oh, like I was literally like run. We ended up getting beat actually that night as well. And I just thought, I can't do this any longer because... Like, you just end up kind of running a bit weird because, like, we've got a little baby in my belly and, like, you don't want to get hit. And, like, that's not my game. Like, I like the hip folk. So, <laughs> yeah, like, I then had to then fake an injury because I didn't want to tell people that I was pregnant until the 12-week scan. Um, just because you didn't know what, if everything's going to be all right. So that was pretty tough. I then did have to tell the coach because I was it was probably not right that I kept for that long anyway. But at the same time, you didn't really want to... I think at the time in that as well, there was nothing in the contracts to say that if you were pregnant, there was no any support put in place. So I didn't want to tell anybody in case it didn't go down well. Then obviously you're a bit like, well, they can't sack you because you could basically sue them. So I kind of had that on my side, side as well. But no, like they, I mean, I'm not really sure if everybody was buzzing for me, but they obviously said that they were. Um, then after that, I just kind of did my own bit of training which when I look back, it was actually really, really lonely, like, which is quite, quite sad to think about it. But they, you just kind of get left to do your own thing. I think that's another thing. There's not really that much research on that side of stuff to see how much like you can and can't do. So every single day, like I basically just went on the bike. Then when I got too heavy, I just went swimming. And I felt that I had to go to training every day as well, just because they were still paying me. So I felt under pressure to still be at the training ground every single day, like even at like... 40 weeks I was still going in because I just was like well maybe not actually 40 weeks because I think I broke off 39 maybe and she was two weeks late anyway so but yeah like that was that I think that was pretty tough because at least like if you do like you've got like a long-term injury and that you have like a program and like there's milestones to hit and like you start progressing and the coaches show a little bit more interest in you because you're closer to being back and like more useful for them whereas like you're pregnant and you're out for nine months and probably another I was seven at the back of that that you're no good to the team, so you do just kind of get like left to the side, and yeah. But I, don't, I mean, everybody would probably be the same. Maybe that's just, or maybe they just didn't like me. I'm not really sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Emma McCandy speaking on the Koi Gig podcast. Well worth checking out the full interview. Emma Byrne was part of it, part of the Koi Gig podcast, and that interview. Former Republic of Ireland and Arsenal goalkeeper. She's with us in the line. Evening, Emma. Hello, how are you? Very well. Going? Yeah, great. Louise Galvin, Kerry footballer, Irish Ruby International, uh, high profile return to the Kerry jersey shortly after giving birth as well. Uh, Louise, great to have you on. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the show. How are you? Great. Emma, you obviously sat in on that full interview. It sounded, just to talk about Emma McCandy specifically for a moment, it certainly sounded like her experience at Reading was a miserable one. What struck you about the interview? Um... I, you know, I know Emma very, very well. So I was kind of with her through all the steps anyway. Um, I just think, you know, it kind of hit home when she was saying about how lonely it was. You know, she was on her own. As any injury is, when you're injured coming back, it is quite a lonely place. But the fact that she was going to be out for that long and she had to basically try and keep herself right on her own, I thought was, yeah, it was a little bit sad. Um but, you know, that that's how it is. That's how inexperienced the clubs are at the moment in, in this in this regard. Like they don't have any experience on how to train a pregnant uh, footballer and, and what they need to do with these players. So it's just basically down to inexperience. On the financial side, Emma, so there was a study in 2017, FIFPRO did at the World Players Union, and they found an amazing statistic, really, that just 2% of players were mothers. Many women uh, quit the sport, quit football because of a lack of maternity policy. So that was a real crisis a point, I would yeah. think, in 2017. 2021, uh, FIFA implemented new rules for maternity leave. So players entitled to a minimum of 14 weeks maternity cover on two thirds their salary. And the English FA went one step further. It was 14 weeks of maternity leave 
on 100% of their wage. So mm-hmm. Emma McCandy talked there about the loneliness of, of training and feeling a pressure to go in to training while she was still uh, pregnant. Uh, presumably before she gives birth, her maternity leave doesn't kick in. Is, is the norm that a female player is on, on full pay across the nine months and then the 14 weeks maternity leave kicks in because this is not obviously a normal profession whereby most pregnant women in most uh, jobs can work for the vast majority of their pregnancy. That Footballers can't do that, obviously. So uh, to what extent does 14 weeks cut the mustard here? I mean, it all depends on, on the person, how, how quickly they come back. But it's it's not long enough. It's definitely not long enough to get to try and get back to the level you were at. Absolutely not. Um, and, and the problem is, I'd just like to to say with Emma, um, Reading did pay the maternity leave, which is for me the basic thing to do, but they did honour that contract. Um, but the problem is that it's not a normal job. You're right. It's, you know, Emma had to go into training as any pr- woman would go into work, but it's the aftercare and, and coming back and you as as a club, you want to get this player back to to the level they are at, and Emma McCandy is an extremely important player for Reading as well, and they just don't have the knowledge on how to do that. Yes, they have doctors and physios, but these are you know the physios are trained to get players back from injuries and things like that, and and that was Emma's main problem. Right, and um, it, it wasn't the pay, although they aren't paid enough anyway because you know, to get childcare and to have to pay childcare and stuff like that. It's just not enough. But um, Emma's problem was when she was coming back that she didn't know when to push herself. She didn't know what to do. She was left on her own a lot. And and that was really difficult for her. And, you know, Emma's extremely competitive as well. She wanted to get back as soon as possible, but nobody really could help her in that aspect. OK, so that was more so her issue maybe than the pay, which is obviously important. Yeah, but well. she also was what I consider a lucky because before that, as she said herself, the the contracts only came into play as she was yeah. she was coming out of um of work, going on to maternity leave. Whereas before that, there was absolutely nothing, and it was a choice: you either have a baby, um, and stop playing. Um, but we had players in our team at Arsenal that had kids and came back, but it was because our manager at the time. Um, was very good and he was um, very, you know, kind of up to date, really more modern. And he allowed time off and he allowed them to bring their their kids in to work with them and just kind of like allowed that balance of of having a kid and, and playing football. Louise, you're perfectly placed to give us the experience of coming back to sport after giving birth. I think you surprised, uh, I think the video got millions of views in the end. Ashley O'Reilly was speaking to you after an All-Ireland semi-final against Mayo. You were in your Kerry jersey and uh, you were, I mean, it was brilliant in a way, very progressive for for sport at large. You were talking about, well, I've, I've been breastfeeding my newborn son in the dressing room there and then I went out and played the match. And uh, you have a, a, a perfect insight, I suppose, to give us about uh, presumably the dearth of knowledge when it comes to how uh, mothers should come back from pregnancy and, and, and approach sport. Yeah, I definitely think dearth is a good kind of descriptive word for what's out there. Um, I suppose similar to Emma, when like I would have finished the Kerry season 2021 playing my last game around eight or nine weeks. Um, now, obviously GA is an amateur um, sport, so there wasn't any contracts or anything at play. Um, and I did speak to my managers even for the game and got medical clearance and that. Um, but I suppose it all comes back to even as well, for women who are trying to have a, a baby and play sport at the same time, like you're putting it off because you want to get the most out of your sporting career, which isn't great either. I mean, and if you run into difficulty then trying to conceive, you have all this potential guilt around that. Um, and I guess we were really lucky and I didn't know if ever would get back, but uh, kind of as things progressed and the, the season was going with Kerry, there was a slight glimmer of hope and I kind of went for it, hammer and tongs. Um, and to be honest, like it was incredibly difficult. Um, I certainly didn't get back to my peak or anywhere near it in time for a championship. And I suppose it's more to say it was on the panel as opposed to actually playing. Um, but how it worked out well for me was built on more relationships with people around me, including the management and the, and the team, rather than any actual structure, rather than any blueprint to follow. And similarly, you know, just like Emma was saying, the SNCs, physios, they're all there, they're trained around um 
players returning from injury, not returning from uh, sort of a kind of women's health specialist point of view. So all of that I would have done off my own kind of bat, went off and um, got my private women's health physio appointments to make sure I was safe to progress in terms of like my pelvic health and um, post, post-surgery because I ended up having a section as well. Um, okay. But I guess I was lucky in that from my I suppose, international rugby experience, um, I had done an awful lot of gym on my own and I had a fairly good idea of like my body and we have a, a gym out the back. So I was able to, you know, luxuries that other players don't have. I was able to maybe tailor my own training a lot through that knowledge. Um, but I guess that the saddest thing for me was the amount of players, both in my club and in the county team who were like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're back. It's it's great. But I, didn't, I thought after having a baby, you couldn't come back or it just wasn't seen. And it's just so sad that that's the the norm out there because like just like we said at the beginning um the prime kind of years for i suppose fertility and having babies are also your prime years for yeah. reaching your peak performance it's important the two should be able to go hand in hand but they really don't and Louise, you work as a physio so you've a, you know a deeper understanding than your average person of, of the area of sports science as well uh, for postnatal athletes, uh, it, so it sounds listening to you like there's no real blueprint that is readily available. I saw in a piece in the Irish Independent that you uh, were speaking to Sinead Kassan and you, you remember asking even the public health nurse when she came to the house, so when can I, for instance, play contact sport? And it was a pre- pretty blank look that came back at you. So that knowledge just isn't out there across the board. No, and look, in fairness, public health nurse has a lot to cover from baby, from, from the cradle to the grave, as they say out in the community. So I wouldn't expect her to maybe have that knowledge as well. No, and, and to be fair to her, it's, it's suggested, it. it's suggested, it's not something she's been asked all that no, often, she maybe. She's she never, never asked that before. Um, right. So, yeah, the, the knowledge just isn't out there. And when I went searching, there are some guidelines, um, like it, there's kind of more UK based guidelines around returning to run. Um, but it's, it was literally starting running at 12 weeks, whereas I was back in McCary at 10 weeks. Now, I wouldn't say that's the way to do it. It was just the way the season was going. If I wanted to get back, I had to get back pretty mm-hmm. ASAP. Um, and then there was some other guidelines that came in from the American side. And I, I guess, it, again, it's so individualized because it's based on your train. Like as an athlete, it's based on your, your training age, what you've done before, um, your level of fitness. And then obviously the pregnancy that you had the type of delivery that you had and then how you are right now. I mean, there's such high rates of things like postnatal depression, uh, your, how you're maybe feeding your baby, is your baby sleeping at all? The desire to get back. There's just so many variables um, that I can I can see why maybe there was no guidelines up until now, but I think it does need to, to change because if women do want to get back playing, that should be achievable. And we're not talking about, you know, investing millions of euro or whatever it is into finding these guys it's probably mostly common sense based but there's yeah. just very little out there at the moment emma it's it's quite interesting you said that things were pretty progressive at arsenal just by dint of having the right manager at the right time and uh, maybe those arsenal players were lucky as a result the fa imposed this 14 week minimum that's not to say that should be the maximum are many clubs going above and beyond and making things you know ultra easy for prospective mothers what's your sense of the WSL at large beyond reading beyond arsenal yeah i mean I, you know the fa have the guidelines in place and the policy in place but you know as louise says it changes all the time it's not it's it can't be specific to certain players um and i think some clubs are too specific with that, those guidelines. Like obviously, you know, we, we had loopholes coming back from, from having a baby four months after since she's straight back in training and looks extremely fit. She looks like she's ready to play. Um, with uh, Emma Mitchell, it's different. She had complications, so it's going to take her a bit longer. And Reading knew that. Like you obviously you can't force uh, people to train if they can't train. It It is literally if they're fit to train, they can train. So, yeah, I mean everyone's different and the clubs will treat it differently. But for example, like in the case of, of Reading, like they don't have, their policy is no children in, in at the training ground. Um, I think it's to do with insurance or something like that, where other clubs I know for a fact do allow that because they're going to accommodate the fact that 
moms might not be able to get a sitter on a Sunday or on a, you know, Monday evening at eight o'clock or whatever, because it's not your normal nine to five. So I do know other clubs do accommodate that and they allow maybe they come in for a cool down or they'll have someone in there that can take care of the of the baby while while the the, the mom is training. But that's not a policy. It's not, you know, written in the contract. It just depends on on who's at the club and and their power in the club, I suppose. I mean, this is more of a cultural question almost, but like, was it when it came to motherhood, was there ever an atmosphere where it was discouraged? Was there ever, you know, like for a manager, it's akin to, well, I've just lost, you might as well have a cruciate injury. Like I've lost you for X number of months now. Was there ever a sense of, girls, big season, let's not have anybody get, you know, it's not, I presume it never <laughs> went. Nobody's allowed to get pregnant. Yeah. Oh, but I, I presume it was never that dysfunctional down the years. No, it wasn't. But, you know, as a player, um, as Louise says, that you, you want to play at the top level when you're in your prime. And if you were planning on having a baby, you're you're basically saying I'm not going to play for a year, which is a really difficult decision for uh, for any athlete. Um, and the fact is that it wasn't really known. It wasn't really a common thing. If somebody got pregnant, it was like, oh, see you, bye. Might never see you again. Have yeah. a good life type of thing. Because contracts wouldn't um, be especially long either. No, you know, and it wouldn't. And, and it just wasn't done. Like people, players had kids and they just didn't come back uh, for right. it. And they weren't really encouraged to. Um, right. In fact, the first person... I was kind of gobsmacked by was Katie Chapman because Katie already had a, a child when she was at Fulham and then she came to Arsenal and she fell pregnant soon after that. And I was like, oh, wow, congratulations and all this. You know, we're heading into Champions League. It's a shame. And she's like, I'll be back for the final. You get to the final, I'll be back. I was like, oh, OK, brilliant. But I was a little bit shocked by it. But um, again, it is down to mentality and and how they're encouraged to get back as well. And I think at Arsenal, they're always encouraged. Katie was training out like that. I'd say she was seven months gone and she was still running around with us. Obviously, we were taking very good care of her. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, it just depends on the club, which I don't think it should be that. There should be certain, you know, in the contracts and, and players should feel like it's their right to have a kid if they want to have a kid and be encouraged to do so. Yes. So there's, there's really a catch up here. Louise, you did allude to uh, the, the priorities uh, female players would have their uh, sporting career versus having a child and often falling into the very understandable, I was going to say trap uh, or tendency to, to put it off. And then maybe, you know, I mean, I think the older we get, we all realise uh, how common fertility problems are. And so there's a, you, you mentioned, God, would there be a guilt there? I don't know. And it probably applies to uh, women in their careers right across the board, but certainly in sport, when your window is so small in comparison with other sports, I don't know whose responsibility it, it is. Um, but you would you would kind of hope the point is made to younger players and or, or, or female players in their mid twenties, like this is something you really should think about. You know, consider your fertility. Can I don't know? You consider freezing your eggs if you want, but like almost an open dialogue. If if think about your sporting career and your ambitions to be a mother very much in tandem and it doesn't sound like that conversation is happening in a very open way maybe listening to you well that conversation like I've played across three sports is, and it's never happened um, it's yeah I think it's more it's, it's a bit more global than that it's a bit more societal that you know I even could see the way people look at you when you're as soon as you're pregnant they're already writing you off and it might be just you know your neighbor or a friend it's like gosh well, that's the end of it now and the amount even, of people even before that louise when you get married when you get married the next thing is oh when you're having kids and it's like in people's mindset straight away right yeah yeah uh, even when i got engaged i got engaged at a dubai sevens tournament and i remember the head coach thought it was looked a bit I don't know and then someone else said I bet you he thinks you're pregnant which I thought was hilarious and like that that was probably his next thought process that I was gone for the rest of the season or something um but yeah I think it's more of a societal thing that people in general but in and out of sport just start to see you differently and there's probably even a bit of an expectation that you should be at home minding the baby and that's that's all you should do because like 
it's difficult coming back, but also what's changed now is we keep talking about the pregnancy, okay, nine months and, yeah. you know, your body completely changes and then you have to go back to the fitness level. But you also have a baby to mind that's growing and then starting to crawl and starting to walk and you're talking about babysitting. And like often as sports go, your partner's probably a lot of the time involved in sport as well and it's trying to juggle that side of it so um and if it's not encouraged or facilitated or even just in the media like seen as a norm thing it's yeah. it's just almost subconsciously written off so i think everyone has the kind of a it's not just management because in fairness a manager wants all their best players on the pitch yes. i don't think that's an unfair thing um for them to want you know i don't expect them going around telling you maybe consider having a family early but at the same time I think societally if you know it it becomes normal that oh yeah she's having a baby it's up to her then if she wants to come back and try and play again after that and that her own like support network support that if they if they can and the team and the management and just the general I suppose media world social media that it's not seen as oh you're not gone off you're you're still yes, playing yeah yes. you know so i think it, it goes a bit bigger than just within the team environment yeah and, and emma final thought it it should be encouraged it should be openly talked about you you, you would hate to think of of young players putting their sporting career first because they felt they had to and then meeting problems in later life when they wanted to become a parent and having a huge sense of regret and and you know that that should not be the cost of a sports career no, no, absolutely not. And it, when you think about football contracts, a lot of them are two years, one year, two years. And, and to fall pregnant in that, it is it is difficult then, you know, to try and get another contact, contract, which again is another problem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely should be spoken about. And, you know, players need to be honest about it and to feel like they can be honest with their, their managers and coaches say, yeah, I'd like to have a baby within this time. Um, but I'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon, to be quite honest. Right. You still think there's a way to go, clearly? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Uh, really great discussion. Thank you both so much for the time. Much appreciated. Emma Byrne and Louise Galvin with us. Emma, of course, was part of that chat, which is on the Koi Gig podcast. It's available uh, right across the uh, football podcast feed, so you should find it very easily. Just search for Koi Gig otherwise. And that's an association with Cabri FC, official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland Women's National Team. Back in one moment.